Today is always a very special day for me personally. It's especially the case with the class of 2015 because you were freshmen when you called me here to pastor you, and so you're the first class that I've had the privilege to be with your entire high school experience. And so I've put a lot of thought and prayer into what I wanted to say to you today, and I feel like the Lord has clearly led me to Luke chapter 10 and verse 38 through 42. I feel like the topic that we'll discuss from this text is one in which I've failed you. I haven't encouraged you in this area as I should have, and yet, if Jesus were your pastor, I think he would have probably focused here almost exclusively. I didn't fail you because it's controversial or especially deep. In fact, just the opposite. It's very basic and we'll all most likely agree. Honestly, it's probably just because we tend to forget the basics. And this is something that the Lord has been teaching and reminding me of over the last several months. And so having said that, I hope you'll accept my apology, know that I'll do better with future classes, but I hope mostly that you will hear from the Lord this morning before you head off into a new stage of life, wherever that may be. I wonder if someone were to follow you around over the next week of your life, a stranger that didn't know you, with a video camera, what would they conclude is your number one priority? And I ask you in that way, because if I walked around to each of you and said, what's your number one priority? You would know to say in church, to your pastor at least, Jesus is my priority. But I think one thing that we'll learn from this text this morning is that our priorities are not defined by what we want them to be or what we say that they are, but rather by what we do. And so, would that stranger who has followed you around for an entire week, videotaping your life, would they conclude that Jesus is your priority? That his word is your priority? Or would they have to conclude based on the raw footage, they don't know you, that schoolwork is your priority, or that athletics is your priority, or that socializing, or entertaining, or entertainment, those are your priorities, or folding laundry, or cleaning house, or caring for the kids, or mowing the lawn, or watching the game, or posting on Facebook, or keeping up with the phone, that's this person's priority based on the footage. And none of those things are bad things. In fact, every one of them are good things. And I think that's another thing that we'll learn from this story of Mary and Martha, that often the very things that distract us are good things. But they distract us from the one thing that Jesus will say in this text, we must do. The body of this scene is Jesus' teaching. And the text gives us no indication whatsoever as to what he is talking about or what he's teaching. We just know that he's in the living room. Well, we don't even know he's in the living room, but let's pretend he's in there and he's teaching. And we don't know what he's teaching. And I think that's intentional. Because while whatever he was teaching is amazing, it's left out in the text because I think the initial reason that Jesus went into this home today was to teach Martha this eternal lesson. And I think Luke saw that. And he wants us to learn the same thing. And so what we have this morning in this text is the master. He has paused for just a few moments. He has stopped everything that he is doing. He has interrupted his travels to teach us something very important. And I wonder if you'll stop and stop. And listen to him this morning. I hope that you will. As you turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Luke chapter 10 and verse 38 and through 42. If you don't, it'll be on the screen. But I want you to do something with me that we don't typically do. You can follow along in the text as I preach. I want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to read this text to you. I'll read it slowly. And I just want you to envision it in your mind's eye. Listen to the word of God. So if you would... Close your eyes for just a few moments. The scripture says, Now, 
as they were traveling along. He entered a village, and a woman named Mary welcomed him into her home. She had a sister, I'm sorry, the woman's name was Martha, welcomed her into her home. And she had a sister named Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted by all her preparations. And she came to him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, and it shall not be taken from her. Father, we gather around your word this morning to marinate in it so that we can be changed. And so I pray that your spirit would be our teacher. And I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear your word. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen. Jesus is traveling along and he enters this village and this dear, sweet, believing woman invites him into her home. And Jesus is immediately the perfect house guest. Any of you who are entertainers, hostess, gifted with the gift of hospitality and enjoy having people into your home, you know that Jesus is doing exactly what you want a, a, a friend, someone to come in to do, and that's just make himself at home and be comfortable. And so Jesus does. He goes into the living room and he just makes himself comfortable. He begins to do what Jesus does, and that's teach. This is actually a transitional moment in the book of Luke. Luke, the first stage is Jesus' birth and his childhood. And then it goes into the second stage, the beginning of his ministry. And that's marked and chalked full of all these great miracles that Jesus performed. And then Jesus sends these 70 guys who he had been training, his disciples, out in 35 teams of two. And he tells them, go into all of these little towns and villages along the way to Jerusalem and prepare them for me to come. And then Jesus steps into this third phase of his ministry where he's on the road to Jerusalem. This text happens about one month before Jesus goes into Jerusalem for his triumphant entry, his last week of life before he dies on the cross. And he's about to travel to all these little villages. And you'll see in Luke that he puts all of his... Um, miracles aside, he doesn't do that very much anymore, and he focuses on this traveling teaching ministry. And so it makes sense that he goes into this home and he's teaching. And the woman that invited him into his home or in her home was Martha. Meet Martha for just a second. Martha is clearly a hardworking woman, first of all, because Jesus never traveled alone. So when you invite Jesus into your house for dinner, you've subsequently invited 13 grown men, plus whoever else was around, into your home. So she's got a big job ahead of her, and she's a hard worker, and she's gifted with hospitality, and she's excited to serve Jesus. She wants him to enjoy his afternoon. She wants him to take a break from work for a few moments, get away with his best of friends, just be able to relax, enjoy a nice meal, maybe even catch a nap before he goes back on the road to do his traveling. But Mary's also a strong, type A, in charge, verbal woman. She's not the kind of person that you wonder where you stand with her. She's the kind of woman that's going to let you know exactly where you stand with her. She speaks her mind. She says it how she sees it. And she doesn't hold back. She does that in this text, but she also does it, if you remember, when, um, G when Lazarus died and Jesus shows up on the scene. Martha, first one to greet him. This is your fault, Jesus. If you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. She just... She's a strong woman. She's the homeowner. She's the hostess. She's the one that invited him 
She's the one that's put all this together. She's Martha. And she has a sister named Mary. Mary's a little different. Mary is a student of the Lord Jesus. The teachings of Jesus is what rings Mary's bell. Now, she's been accused of being lazy and inconsiderate, but it's not true. She just has a preference. She has a priority. She wants to be at the feet of Jesus. She sees the scene the way it really is. She can see this rare opportunity where the master is going to step aside privately with a few of his close friends and say something, and she's not going to miss it. We can eat cold hot dogs if that's what we're going to do, but I'm not going to miss this opportunity. Others have tried to say that this is the flagship for monastic living. We should be monks and nuns and just go sit at the feet of Jesus all the time and never do anything but live this contemplative life. And I don't think you can take that from the text. Leon Morris points out that it falls right on the heel of the Good Samaritan. So Jesus expects both, but he does say this is the best thing, what Mary is doing, to be sitting and listening. Others have tried to make Mary out to be this, like, swooning emotional type just loving to be around Jesus, head on his knee, looking up at him, not too concerned about what he's saying, but just happy to be around Jesus. She melts. I don't, that's not what the text says about Mary. She's sitting at his feet doing what? Listening to the words of Christ. Mary would have been the kind of woman that came to church with a Bible and a notebook and a pen, and you would never see her face. The pastor would never see his face, just her top of her head, meticulously writing down everything that the Lord has to say. But Martha, on the other hand, I love what the text says, is distracted, cumbered. It means pulled away. Well, pulled away by what? Responsibilities, duties, service. She's distracted by good stuff, and not just good stuff, but good stuff for Jesus. But in her distraction, She's only able to see this situation her own way. And so she gets frustrated. She gets frustrated with the situation like any hostess would. The bread is going to burn. The table isn't set. And Peter drugged mud in the house like he always does. Who doesn't take their shoes off? She's frustrated with Mary. What is she doing? Can't she see that of all times I need her now the most? She's not a man. She's not a disciple. She's not training for leadership. This isn't 21st century America. This is 1st century Palestine. And women have their place. She should be in here with me. She's being lazy. She's being inconsiderate. Sure, I would like to listen to Jesus as well. But I have responsibilities. I have important things to do. It must be nice to just have time to sit around and listen to Jesus. And you can see, as her frustration grows, she would have been banging pots, making sure that everybody else in the house knew she was frustrated and she was stressed out and that what she was doing was important and nobody seemed to care. She's huffing and she's puffing and she's getting herself all worked up. She's so focused on Martha and what Martha is doing and what Martha wants to accomplish, it causes her to not see what's really going on, and to be more and more frustrated. And so she decides she's going to engage in an argument. And like we so often do when we're about to argue with our spouse or a co-worker, we begin to practice and rehearse. So now she's in the kitchen, and she's banging pots and pans around and slamming drawers, and she's mumbling under her breath what she's going to say, and she gets her so worked up and so anxious and so frustrated, and finally it just comes out, Jesus, don't you care? Do you care about me, Jesus? What an accusation. Mary's over the top. Martha's over the top. Martha's out of control. She's so focused on herself, she's totally blind to the big picture, so much so that she goes into the living room and interrupts God incarnate to question his love for her. John MacArthur writes it like this, and I think this is hilarious. He says, well, Jesus, are you just going to sit there and keep talking about divine, life-changing, 
soul-transforming, sin-shattering, heavenly blessing-producing, joy-giving, peace-bringing, glorious truth, and ignore the fact that the table isn't set? She's out of control. She can't see the big picture. She's so distracted by the non-essentials that she actually questions God's love for her. This is the God of heaven who left heaven for Martha. This is the God of heaven who is on his road just one month away from sacrificing his life for Martha's sins of distraction and anxiety and worry and whatever else this dear woman struggled with. This is, this is the God on whom you can cast all your cares because he cares for you. But Martha can't see any of that. All she can see is that no one's helped put ice in the glasses. And so she questions God's love for her as we so often do as well. If you really loved me, why did I have this situation? Why won't you take this addiction away? Why won't you help me financially? And then that leads into self-pity. Jesus, don't you care that I'm all alone? No one cares about me. No one understands me. No one knows what I truly do. We get whiny, don't we, sometimes? No one wants to be sad. But there is a self-pity that feels good. That's why country music is so popular. <laughs> no one wants to be sad, but self-pity is nice. No one really knows what I do. We claim that we want Jesus, but we get frustrated when he doesn't do what we ask him to do. We're so good at saying, if you loved me, Jesus. And it's because we want a genie in the bottle, Jesus. We want a Jesus who can be powerful and do anything and grant all our wishes, but we hold the lamp because the one holding the lamp controls the genie. And it's at that point when D.A. Carson will interrupt you and say, don't judge God's love for you based on your current and temporary situation. Rather, judge God's love for you by a little hill outside of Jerusalem called Calvary. And so Jesus corrects her lovingly. Martha, Martha, isn't it kind and gentle? It's almost grandfatherly. Martha, Martha, but he cuts right to the heart. He says, you're worried and bothered by so many things. Probably not just like this moment. Probably just defining Martha. You're always worried. You're always bothered. You're always anxious. And sometimes we convince ourselves that our symptoms are our problem. My fit of rage... Sure, it's wrong, but it's, it's okay in this situation. My, whatever your sin is, doesn't matter. You, you kind of reason with yourself that it's okay given your situation. Because all we see is the now and the symptoms. But Jesus always sees past the situation, past the symptoms, right into our hearts. Because I sympathize with Mary. I would have been mad too. Or Martha. I can't keep getting them mixed up. I, I would have been mad too. It's my house. I'm the one that invited him here. I'm using my gifts and my talents to serve Jesus for a few hours and everything is going wrong and no one cares. But Jesus says truth. He says, Martha, you're so full of anxiety. So full of worry. Bothered all the time. But for what? This stuff doesn't even matter. This stuff isn't going to last. It's not that it's kind, and hospitality is certainly needed, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. In fact, most of life doesn't matter. In fact, only one thing matters. 
my word. The words of the Lord. The revealed word of God. And Martha, if you miss this, you're going to miss it all. Raising kids, working hard, serving God, it's all important. But if you miss this main ingredient, you're going to miss it all. And you'll begin to do things for the wrong reason and out of order. And your priorities will be out of whack. And you will live a worried, frustrated life. You see, when it comes to Bible stories, I think so often because we grew up in church and we know the ends and we know what we're supposed to learn out of these stories, we quickly identify with the good guys and condemn the bad guys. But if the truth were told, I am so much more like Martha than I am Mary. So what has you distracted? And is it eternal? Does it even matter? Listen, if you try to fit God's word into your busy schedule when you have time, your priorities are totally out of whack. If you try to fit God's word into your busy schedule when you have time, you've got things twisted and you're out of balance. And so what is distracting you? What worries you? What bothers you? And is it eternal? Does it even matter? But after this loving correction, there's an invitation for Martha and for you. Notice Jesus sees this hardworking, driven, successful, task-oriented, busy woman. And he deals with her busyness, not by giving her a self-help booklet on, you know, 10 ways to kind of manage your life different or create margins. He, He instead gives her something to do. He, he deals with her busyness by saying, there's one thing you better not miss. And it's almost like Jesus is saying, listen, I don't know what you want to do. I don't know how you're going to clean up your schedule a little bit. I don't know what you need to go home and do to change, but don't miss this one thing. And he does it the worst way possible. He says, Mary's chosen the better portion. Which, if you have children, you know what that's like, right? One comes in, tattles to get the other in trouble, and ends up getting themselves in trouble because they're tattling or embellishing the story or whatever. And that's what she does. She goes in to get Mary corrected. Have Mary join me in the kitchen. And instead, Jesus says, you need corrected and you needed to join Mary. Archibald Robinson says, you can do, 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 And do some more for God. But you will miss dessert if you miss his fellowship. He goes on to say, and it will not be taken away from her. In other words, I'm not sending her into the kitchen. I met this lady the other day who declared to me that she was too much of a feminist to become a Christian. And I didn't think of this text, but I wish I would have. Because you... You don't have to like it, and I don't like it. But first century Palestine wasn't winning any, like, women's liberation awards. In fact, women, if you lived in first century Palestine, and you witnessed with your own eyes a murder, you would have been told that you are too prone to lying and an inferior intellect to be a credible witness in a court of law. It wasn't a good place for women. The Jewish Talmud actually says, let the, Mo- the law of Moses be burned before read and taught by a woman. So it wasn't a great place for women. And so if you're looking for a women's movement in first century Palestine, look to Jesus. He says, I'm not sending her into the kitchen. She's exactly where she needs to be. But I don't point that out because I want to start a women's liberation movement. I, I point that out because I want you to see This is for all Christians. Mary wasn't training to be a pastor or a teacher or a leader or a deacon or a missionary or anything like that. Jesus props this normal, everyday woman up as our example and says she got it right. She's what every Christian ought to be doing. She has the right priorities. Be like her. Love my word. Sit at my feet. Jesus says, not everyone will say to me, or who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Really? Not everybody who says Jesus is my Lord goes to heaven? Well, then Jesus who does go to heaven. All of those who hear and do 
my words. Jesus, one of the disciples say, your mother and your brother, they're outside looking for you. And Jesus' answer, my, mother's and my, or my mother and my brothers are those who hear and do the word of the Lord. Jesus makes a huge deal about hearing God's word, a major priority in the life of the truly converted one it should be. But what's even bigger than women's lib and what's even bigger than the Christian priority is what Jesus is offering here. He says, it will not be taken from her. He is willingly and freely and abundantly offering himself to anyone who wants him. There's never going to be a point where Jesus says to you, all right, enough's enough. You've worn me out for today. He freely gives himself away. And he wants you if you want him. But Jesus cannot be separated from his word. This is how you know him. This is how you experience him. This is how you obey him. And so Jesus says to Martha, I'm not going to have Mary join you in the kitchen. Will you join her? And I wonder what Martha's response is. <laughs> See if I ever invite you over again. Or maybe it just flew over her head. Maybe she gets it. Okay, she doesn't have to join me, but I got stuff to do. I got to get back in there. But maybe she sat down. Maybe they ate dry meat and burnt bread that day. I want to share with you guys some life lessons that I think you can take away from this text. Number one, Jesus' word must be your priority. David says it in Psalm chapter 27 and verse 4. He says, One thing that I ask from the Lord and that I should seek, that I might dwell in his, the house of the Lord all the days of my life and behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Paul says it in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. More than that, I count everything else as lost in the view of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. John MacArthur writes, Our lives are so full of, unnecess of the unnecessary they control us. They ruin our attitudes. They whack away at our relationships. We get so frustrated over things that don't really even matter, whether politics or stuff you get yourself involved in in your workaday world or your neighborhood. Commit your life to one thing, to see the beauty of the Lord like David and to make being made like Christ, like Paul, knowing that the paths of these things prior to those things is to hear him speak because the own, that is the only way you will ever know him. That is the only way he reveals his beauty. And so he says to Mary, you have chosen the good part. Robert Stein points out that most Christians are like Martha in that they would like to hear Jesus and they want to sit at his feet, but they are so distracted by the tyranny of the urgent. It's good news. For every one of us, for students, it's good news because now you know. Now you know what Jesus wants your priority to be, his word, spending time at his feet. It's also bad news because now you know. And if you miss it, you're going to miss it all. I don't, I'm not a legalist. I don't care how you do it. I don't know what it needs to look like in your life. But don't miss this one thing, to make the word of God your priority. Number two, Jesus doesn't need you or your service. You need Jesus. And this is what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. Because most religions acknowledge, okay, there's some God out there and the world is really messed up. And so clearly we've offended this God. So how are we going to make him happy again? And most religions turn to serve, 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 do, 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 sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Christianity, unlike any other worldview, says, sit down. Jesus has already done the work for you. It's so backwards. It's exactly the opposite of what anyone would ever think. That when the disciples were coming in and Jesus was washing their feet and Peter says, you shouldn't wash my feet. You're better than me. You're the Lord. I'll wash your feet. And what does Jesus say? He was right. He is the Lord. He is better than them. But what does Jesus say? He says, if you don't let me do this for you, Peter, 
you don't have any part with me. Jesus is saying, Peter, I'm not dirty. I don't need you to clean me. You're dirty. You need me. There is nothing more joyous in the world than Christian service. But it is our joy, and it is our gift, and Jesus doesn't need it. You need Jesus. That's the gospel. The gospel is that God created all of this, and he did it right, and he did it well, and everything was perfect. And so what's wrong with the world? Our sin is wrong with the world. And the sin of the world is what's wrong with this world. And this whole place is corrupt and dying and it ain't getting any better. But Jesus comes and he lives this perfect life that you couldn't live. And he dies a sinner's death that you could only or that you could never die for yourself. And he raises again and he defeats death and he defeats sin. And he offers this free gift to anyone who would just sit at his feet and take it. Number three. Doing the work of Jesus on earth takes the whole body working together. See, sometimes we get so focused on what we are doing and what God has called us to do and our passions and our desires and our gifts and we begin to compare them to everybody else and think that what we're doing is actually better and more important and we get frustrated with other Christians. Whatever God has gifted you to do, do it with all your might and take it seriously. But don't take yourself too seriously. Because someday you'll be replaced and someone else will do it. But not everyone can adopt children. Not everyone can fight sex trafficking. Not everyone can volunteer at the pregnancy center or the food pantry. Not everyone can enjoy and, and earn degrees and teach classes. Not everyone can sing in the choir. Not everyone can open their homes to strangers and to guests. Not everyone can run a business. It takes us all working together, valuing each other's work to see the kingdom advanced. Number four. There's only five. Number four. Sometimes the thing that has you most upset is the very thing that Jesus is going to use to invite you to sit down. Mary was, or Martha was so self-focused, narrowed in on her situation, that she questions God, blames God, and as you can imagine, even was upset with God. But what she needed, more than she needed Jesus to see life her way, more than she needed Jesus to fix her problems the way that she thought he should, what she needed was to sit down and shut up and listen. And sometimes the thing that has you most worked up is the very thing that Jesus is going to use to draw you. Recently, Stephanie and I found out that our 18-month-old daughter, Brinley, has a rare heart condition. She's going to have to have heart surgery on June 1st. And our church has been so great just to remind us they're praying and send us cards and ask about her. But we are so thankful to God for how he has made our daughter and how he has made her heart. This is what it has taken for me to just stop and slow down and enjoy God and enjoy my family. This is what it has taken for me to trust God with her more than any team of doctors. And I do. And I love doctors. I think it's awesome what they can do, but I trust the Lord with her so much. I've often wondered about myself, do I really love God more than I love my children? Because the text says, if you love God, your family and your children more than you love God, you will have no part with him. It's taken this situation to reveal to me that there's no comparison. I love God so much more than I love Brinley. And I want more than anything else in the world, 
I want God to be glorified in this. I want God's kingdom to be advanced in this. And I want to be made and everyone involved made more like Jesus because of it. And before I get too self-righteous, keep praying for Brindley because I'm sure I'll be a basket case on the day of the surgery. But for now, there's no fear in our home. There's no doubt in our home. There's no, if you loved us, you would have done this. Number five, there's always an open invitation to you. Jesus knows you to the very core of your being. And he's inviting you this morning to sit down, to rest in him. And he'll give you as much as you can handle. Romans chapter 8, verse 22. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purposes. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And to those who he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say then? If God is for us, then who is against us? And who shall separate, or who, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us, will he not also freeless, freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. He is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus It is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, and is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it is written, we are being put to death all day long for your sake. We are considered like sheep led to to the slaughter, but in all things we are overwhelmingly conquerors through him who has loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor debts or any other created thing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus he gave you Jesus he'll give you everything I think this little story of Mary and Martha ends in John chapter 11 and 12 I and I I think that Martha got it I think she went in and sat down And I say that because in John chapter 11, right after Lazarus died and Jesus shows up, she goes out and she's just like Martha. And that's okay. She's strong. She says what she thinks. It's your fault. Jesus calms her down and says, he'll rise again. I know he'll rise again in the end. No, no, no. I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And listen to verse 27 of John chapter 11. Martha's confession. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Peter made the exact same confession. And Jesus says, that's not from you, Peter, or from man, but that is from God, and I will build my church on that confession. Somewhere along the line, Martha got it. And then, after Jesus raises him from the dead, in John chapter 12, they're all over at Martha's house. Having a celebration. Look at verse 2. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. I wonder if she served with a little bit more contentment that time around. I wonder if she served with a little bit more confidence in Christ's love for her. Lazarus is reclining at the table. Verse 3 tells us that Mary poured out the perfume on his feet and wiped her her feet with her hair and she's doing Mary's thing, you know, being all in with Jesus and then someone criticizes her, Judas Iscariot, not because he cares about the poor but because he is a thief. He says she, she shouldn't have wasted all that money on him and Jesus, being Jesus, defends Mary once again. It's almost the same scene. Leave her alone. She's doing what she ought to do. This text has some calls to it. If you're in the room today and you've never placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you don't have a relationship with him, you don't know that if you died right now you would go to heaven to be with him, he's not your life, he's not your priority, you don't know him at all. This text would say to you, come to Jesus. 
sit at his feet. Stop working so hard. Jesus has done the work for you. Just come to Jesus. And I want to invite you. These graduates are about to walk across the stage, but none of them would say that's more important than you coming down and knowing for sure that you have life in Christ. And we would love to talk with you about how you can know for sure that you're saved. But it also is a call to the distracted. We get so caught up in our serving that we miss dessert. And Jesus is offering himself to you this morning. Will you stop? Will you listen? Will you sit down? What has you distracted? Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. And I pray that you would continue teaching us. And I also pray, Lord, as over these seniors as they are moving on, that you would bless them in the next stages of their life. 